welcome. My name is Sherry Avila, and I will be your hostess today for Avila Fine Arts Lovers. And we have with us today as our guest and author, Sharon Shea Bossard, and she wrote the book, Finding My Irish. And Sharon has told me that in her former life, <laughs> before she wrote her book, that she was a teacher for, was it 23 years? Uh, 29 years. 29 years at Maine East? Maine East High School. Maine East High School. Right. Uh, so now, uh, Sharon, I understand that the first half of your book takes in the task of finding documents and locating information and traveling. In fact, uh, I understand that you were, I, I met you at the Irish Heritage Center Mm -hmm. And uh, you were giving a talk to the Celtic women, I believe it was. I was, yes. Um, I go all over with my book. I go throughout the United States to festivals, and we go throughout uh, Ireland as well. And we're on different radio shows and things, so I'm always very happy. Whenever I'm invited, I bring the book, and I tell people about what it's like to really find that place in Ireland where your grandparents were born and to walk into the cottage and to find the birth certificates and death certificates and to uncover mysteries that might be part of that family. And from what I've heard, most Irish families have lots of secrets and mysteries and I believe that to be true. And in helping us to uh, understand more about her, what her book is all about, uh, she has actually created a mini uh, tea. So we're going to have tea this afternoon. Uh, as the Irish do. Uh, this is to create a, a, a help you to create that atmosphere to help you understand how the Irish in Ireland uh, may not necessarily live. Well, do they live that way today too? Well, or? they do. You see, I discovered this. I've never in my life had tea from a teapot. I, it was always in a mug and it's always you pour the hot water into the mug. That's how, that was my experience of having tea. And we went to Ireland and we knocked on the doors of the cottages and people invited us in. We were strangers, but yet they invited us in because I had the name of their, I had, my name was certainly someone living in their community. They invited me in and they would bring out their teapots, their lovely tea service, and, and their variation of uh, the soda breads, the wheat breads, and an oat cake that doesn't have much of a taste. But that's, I learned, is what the immigrants packed in 1880. That's what my grandmother wrapped in a handkerchief and put in her pocket. So this is the oat cake. That's the oat cake, and there, there truly is no taste. It really, to me, it tastes like straw. And I make them for the festivals and for the different events that I attend because people wonder, what did the immigrants eat on board? And of course, they were given so much food uh, only a day to live on. That's why the moms and dads, they, they, they bake the oat cakes for the, their, their children because my grandmother was 15 when she left Ireland in 1880. So she had a bunch of those with her. And that was the old family story that was always passed on about the oat cakes. So in my journey, uh, going into the cottages in Ireland and seeing the oat cakes, I became very curious. I became more curious about what my grandmother's life was like. And this is my grandmother, Bridget, the lady in that particular picture there. This is there. Bridget? This is Bridget. She was born in 1865. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's remarkable that I even have her picture. Because when you start your search, you really, if you have something, you're very fortunate. I had nothing. I only had, uh, I'd heard uh, rumors, whispered accusations, you know, Irish family always having a fight or two over a pint or two. And uh, we, would end, we would go to my grandmother's house as a child, my, my mother's mother's house. And my mother would always say to us, don't take off your coats. We're not going to be staying here too long. And sure enough, we'd be out the door in less than a half hour with all the fighting and things. So I didn't know much about my Irish and I was maybe a little embarrassed to be Irish because I only saw it as people who were fighting and drinking a lot. Mm -hmm. So when I finally, when I retired from teaching, I wondered, what is it to be Irish? What is it really? And I'm 100% Irish American, second generation, and it was time for me to go to Ireland and find out some things. So was it your retirement that prompted you to write this book? Well, I would say that I've always wanted to write a book, but I never knew oh, about what. I always had a story in my head, but I didn't know what, what it was, and I didn't know what would, what would prompt it. And uh, then going through Ireland, so much was happening. We were meeting so many fabulous people. We were meeting some very um, elderly people who had some wonderful stories about their lives in Ireland growing up. And I had never heard stories like this, but I knew that this would be my grandmother. That would be her stories. And uh, so I started to write them down. And the more people I talked to, the more historians that I met, the more that I knew that we had a story here. And we had a story that a lot of Irish people, and anyone really who's just interested in immigration, 
would really love to read because it tells the story of what life was like in Ireland before they left, and that would be shortly after the famine. But life was never good. It was always very, very hard for the Irish people, and uh, they escaped Ireland. They had to. And then their lives in America, and it, it wasn't easy. In 1880 and 1903, when both sets of my grandparents arrived, they had no education, uh, couldn't really write their names. So uh, they, were, they were alone, and they were young. And when you learn and you, you begin to see how brave they were and uh, what they did here to, get, to help us get to where we are, it, it's just remarkable. And now, what parts of Ireland are your family from, or did you travel? Well, we, uh, we would land in Dublin because we would go to the general records office. We had a lot of records mm -hmm. offices we had to go. And then to my side here, there is a map uh, in Ireland. Um, my, f my mother's family is from Boyle County, Roscommon. That's the green dot on the top. And my uh, Bridget Murphy and Michael Shea, they're from the little dot here. That's Valencia and County Kerry. So we had quite a distance to go back and forth from. But Ireland is so small that when we were in Dublin and we found a record, we could easily get, get ourselves over to the other side of Ireland in, in less than four hours driving. And then uh, we could scoot up to County Roscommon in, in less than two hours. So you could do a lot in a couple of days. So you start out in Dublin because that's where a lot of the records are kept. Correct. And uh, it was all about the records. We did a lot of searching here in America. We went to a lot of cemeteries here, um, had to find where my grandparents were buried. Uh, my dad was born in Omaha, Nebraska, and I had heard that, and I didn't know if that were true, but sure enough, we went there and we found the gravestones. So then it became very interesting. Then I had dates. Most of the times you can trust the dates on those tombstones to be accurate, and that's what we needed. So your Finding My Irish book is a kind of a book about genealogy? Not or? really, and a lot of people okay. ask me that. A lot of people say, well, this is genealogy. I go, no. This, hap the, this is the only title that I could think of because I really found out who I was. So it's more of a finding your Irish uh, in your heart. It is. That's a, Sherry, that's a perfect way to put it. There were document searches within the story, but I go, th I go very uh, simply through that. You know if I've got a document, but you're more interested in the story. You're more interested in the people that I'm meeting and what gets me from one place to the other. Because I did notice that the counties were very different. County Kerry was very welcoming, and that would be my, the Murphy family and the Shea family. They couldn't do enough for us. They welcomed us in, and I had some proof because I had a real old letter from 1949. So when I brought that to the Murphy family, they welcomed me into the family and, in fact, gave me a wedding band of my grandmother Bridget's sister from the 1800s, and that was really something. That cinched that I was a Murphy in that now, family. Now, are you wearing that? Wedding I am. Band? I wear it all the time. I. I wear it everywhere, and it, it means a lot to me because the people who gave it to me were, were very poor, and they have nine children of their own, and they certainly didn't need to be giving a family heirloom away to um, someone who knocked on their door. So uh, I, that means a great deal to me. So that wedding ring is from 1859? Oh, this wedding ring is probably from 1875. 75? Correct. It's got all the carving in there on the Catholic Church. Uh, the church then would, would give the rings uh, to, the, to the groom at that time. Uh, in way, way back when. So this ring has been, uh, if, if this ring could talk, the history of this ring. But I did also uh, discover the history of the lady who wore the ring. That would be Aunt Kate. That would be Bridget's sister. And uh, I don't think uh, Kate ever knew what happened to her sister Bridget. Because once these Irish people left Ireland for America, they were never heard from again. There may have been a few letters that passed back and forth, but the people in Ireland couldn't read. And they were happy to get that letter, but it was difficult to find someone who could truly read that letter to them, especially in 1880. So my grandmother, when she left at 15 and my grandfather at 21, uh, they were as good as dead to their Irish family. And actually, I think when you were giving your talk, you said they actually had a uh, ceremony of some sort, they like did. a wake. Yes. When they, they left to go to America or maybe to go to other countries. Yeah, Sherry, they called it the American Wake. The or American they, Wake? The American Wake. They would hire keeners, and the old women from the village would come in, and they would howl and cry and, and just frenzy themselves because it was as though it was a funeral. And uh, there would be music, and there would be celebration, and uh, a lot of food, and, and the soda bread would be there, and the brown bread, and, uh, and the teas would be there, and, of course, you'd have the beer. And uh, that was a celebration. It went on for hours, sometimes days, I understand. And at the end of that evening, 
the father would dance the last jig with their child. And I can imagine the emotion and the heartbreaking situation that was. And I, in the book, I'm able to cover that part by talking to the people who mm -hmm. have handed, been handed down those memories. And my grandmother, she turned her back on the family and she got into her horse car and she went down the road and with her brother and her sister and that was uh, that was the last. She turned her, her back on Ballahernia and that was her beloved townland. Did you by chance catch the uh, art exhibit that was at the Irish American Heritage Center uh, where the artist uh, drew the homes or painted uh, or now actually photographed I believe homes uh, that were left abandoned I did. in the rural areas of uh, Ireland. I did. Uh, that was quite poignant. Uh, it is. And very interesting to think that uh, uh, there was nobody there to go back to that home. There was nobody. Y you see, in Ireland in those days, uh, the, the one male would inherit the land and the cottage from the father. But the Irish weren't able to purchase their land back from the British until probably around 1880. That's when the proclamation was put forth on the land deeds. And you, but they were very poor and they didn't have the money, so it took them 30, 40 years. So only one son could follow in his father's footsteps and remain in that cottage and work that land. Now, if there were nine other sons, they had to immigrate. If they ever wanted to get married, they'd have to immigrate. The women needed a dowry, and the marriages were arranged. And there was only one woman in the family that could afford the dowry. So, And one of the old stories that, that I heard, which made me laugh, and that I think is just so cute and so Irish, there was a, an, an Irishman in County Roscommon. He was marrying off his daughter, and he had the dowry money. Jeez, and he looked up one morning, and he saw that the, the daughter that wasn't getting married was ugly. And he worried. He said, well, how am I going to get that one married off? Because, you know, I only have one dowry. He switched the brides ah. in the morning of the ceremony, and, and it didn't matter. <laughs> it didn't matter to anybody. Because all they cared about was the dowry. The dowry? Yes, the dowry, correct. And then uh, a lot of Irishmen would either have a donkey or a wife. They were both one mm -hmm. and the same. The woman, of course, worked harder. Yes, actually, <laughs> in the book Donegal Woman. Had you read that book, The Donegal Woman? I haven't, but uh, I understand it's wonderful. Uh, in that book, uh, the young lady who was only about 14 or 15, uh, has uh, her father ends up giving uh, the arranged marriage, uh, uh, the man who's you know was arranged for the marriage, he gives him uh, four chickens. He's kind of forced into giving him four chickens, I believe. Wow. And he also ends up getting some pounds from some other uh, party that was involved in the arrangement. Right. Uh, but that, look at that for four chickens and a yeah. few pounds. <laughs> and, uh, and so he ended up with the pounds he bought. Actually, I think it might have been close to 10 pounds buying a cow. Yes. And so she got to milk the cows and <laughs> take, the, you know, take the eggs for them chickens. <laughs> well, so. you know, well, you know, my cousins who now, uh, my second cousins in Ireland, they tell me stories that in the 1950s and 1960s, they, a lot of places still did not have indoor toilets in those far western regions. And the women would be out. They would have their babies, and two days later, they're out in the fields. And they're slicing. They're, they're, they're using this lane to slice the peat and, to, and to, to stack it and put it in the wagon and cart it to the road to dry. They're doing this. And uh, so hopefully there's an older uh, person in the cottage watching the babies. Now, since you're talking about peat, maybe you'd like to show it to the audience. Yes. Well, I have a, a, a bunch of little peat here. Now, this is peat or turf, and uh, every Irishman has a turf fire burning in their cottage. You can see it as you go through the countryside. You can see the smoke swirling from each little chimney. And they burn this uh, all day because it's very damp in those cottages. The newer cottages are insulated, and, and uh, that's kind of the wave now of the where they're getting more modern, but you've got a great deal of people who still have their turf fires. And this is dug from the ground. This is millions of years. It's all the waste product. It, these are uh, animal fossils. You've got all kinds of hay. You've got gr all grasses in there. And this is in moisture, in a moist field, a bog field. And you know, there's been a lot of research of what's in that bog. And I guess the bog is quite a preservative. They're finding bodies in the bog, and yes, a lot yes. of Irishmen have have dumped a lot of their uh, their old bureaus and old things in the bog. They sink to the bottom. They don't know how far they go down even, and it's a wonderful preservative. Yes. So this is what they cut. They use a sling, and they cut this out of the earth. And it's not everywhere in Ireland that you can cut this from. Uh, I would say a great uh, a great majority of Ireland has the turf fields, but uh, but when you go toward Dublin, of course, there aren't as many fields. But you can see the bog because you can actually see the, the earth sliced into. And then, of course, these are piled. Usually they're in bricks, but my cousins, uh, they don't do the bricks. 
very happy to just get the chunks. It doesn't burn very long. It burns very, very hot. And my cousin, who, when we went to their cottage and they made us all these wonderful breads, they still cook using the peat. So their stoves are turf-fed. So when I asked her for the recipe for the foods that I brought today, she wrote down the recipe, and then she told me how, how hot my turf had to be. <laughs> and I reminded her that I don't have a turf stove at home. So she didn't know quite. Well, how would you determine degree. how hot your turf was? I ruined a lot of soda breads. <laughs> but I finally wrote to her and I said, I think I have it. If any more Americans are curious about how you make your wonderful breads, because they're the best. But this is what she still uses, and it's really something that's stacked up alongside of her house. And one day she told a little story. Uh, just last year there was a fire coming out of her fire, but her chimney. This stuff had gotten so thick, and I'll show you. I have a little cottage here that we burn when we go to the festivals. I burn a little piece of turf, and if you can just see inside there, I don't know if you can get a picture of that, but it's really black in there. It doesn't take much for this stuff to, to begin to, to collect around the side. They had a big fire going on in their fireplace. Now, didn't they also use the uh, turf for to make houses? Um, no, not... I not thought they used them for... Uh, well, they may have, and that may have been before the famine, but they needed all the fuel they could get mm -hmm. you know, to, to burn because they didn't have any way to heat their places. And you know, it does get very cold in Ireland, and they have snow in County Roscommon. County Kerry will have snow, but it's unusual. But it gets very cold, and the winds can get to 70 miles an hour. And their cottages are very thick. Concrete, just totally thick. And the windows aren't, uh, aren't very good in the old cottages. So uh, if they were using that, it was probably be before the famine. And you know, the turf, as a matter of fact, they're going to run out of that in 20 years, Ireland. There will be no more. And that is a great natural resource. So you can no longer take it out of the country. I know that uh, they did find a woman, a fully clothed woman, a fully clothed man in the peat bogs. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, and they have found some, a lot of Celtic treasures sure. uh, that they're studying and investigating further and gaining more historical right. insights from. Well, there's all kinds of archaeological digs going on in Ireland as well, especially around County Roscommon. And uh, it's a bog region. And uh, I, I love talking to those people because of the kinds of things that they're looking for. Now, I thought I was being, uh, I was very curious so that when we were walking along a bog field, I thought I'd step in. <laughs> that was not very smart because the lady that was with me said, you know, they've lost a lot of small animals in the bog. And I said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I was so curious. Uh -huh. I thought, well, how, how, but it's almost like quicksand. Yes. It truly is. Quicksand. And you don't know where the bottom is. Yes. And I, and I was curious. You know, they told me they, it was a mysterious kind of thing, whatever was under there. And I thought, well, I'll just stick my foot in there and see if that wasn't very mm -hmm. smart. Now, you said that even though your book isn't about genealogy per right. se, uh, but yet I understand that you did do some research and you have some birth certificates and death certificates and so I forth. Do. Would you like to share a few with us? I would love to. You know, the book is, is uh, the first half of the book is my journey through Ireland. The second half of the book is uh, the immigrant journey to America in 1880 and 1903. And these, and I hope this is clear, this is an original birth certificate. This was from my grandfather's sister, 1875. This is how large they are. They're still to this day as large. And are they born at home? Um, they're born at home. Midwives, mm -hmm. yes, they're born at home. Um, and that's, there are a lot of, uh, uh, the problem with trying to find your, your ancestors in Ireland is because a lot of the uh, the mothers have died, a lot of the babies have passed away, and, and there's no records of any of that because a lot, they had died at home. And often they didn't report the deaths. Yes. And mm -hmm. I don't think often they report the birth. Correct. <laughs> that is very correct. So who's the person that would report a birth? Would it be the midwife or would it be the parent? It would be the parent. And they would sometimes wait if it were a, a bad season, if, if, they mm -hmm. didn't, uh, if they didn't get to town because they would not make the trip just to record a birth. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would maybe months bef afterward, which then makes the date not accurate. So that makes your record finding very difficult. Now you said you had family from o Omaha, Nebraska? Correct. Uh, actually, I have family, family from Holdridge, Nebraska, oh. uh, and they have also lived in Kearney and other areas, Lincoln and so forth. Well, Nebraska uh, seemed to be the place to immigrate because of the stockyards. Now, my grandfather came in 1880, and he, and he came to Castle Garden. Ellis Island didn't open until 1892. Castle Garden was, was a pretty derelict place. And uh, the immigrants were arriving there. That was one of the main places they were arriving to. And then from there, they would either stay in New York or go to Massachusetts, Connecticut. My grandfather then went to Connecticut, to New London and Norwich, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Stayed there for five years, and I was able to go to Connecticut and actually look in the city directories, find the address of where they lived. 
And it was kind of nice because I got to see they lived right on the edge of the ocean in Connecticut. So if they looked, they could imagine they could see Valencia if they looked hard enough. And I thought that must have been very painful for them to always look across that ocean and wonder what their family were, how they were doing over on the other side. And then in Connecticut, we were also able to find the church they belonged to in the parish. So their marriage record was there. American records are great. Now, do you have a marriage record down here, too? I, let's see. I don't have a marriage record. I didn't bring that with me. But yes, okay. I have a marriage record. They look the same. Mm -hmm. I have a death record. They look the same. Here's a death record. This is of my great-grandfather in 1910. He lived to be 104 years old. And, 104 uh, years old? 104 years old. And my, my family, we like to say that this was William Healy. We like to say that he lived long enough to purchase his land back from the British because he was born in 1804, and that was a time when the, when the British had a stronghold on the Irish. You know, that in 1802, there was an uh, act of union where they were completely subjugated to the British, so life was held for the Irish. And that was where we came into some problems with the famine. Yes. Uh, do you, would you like to share with the audience a little bit about the famine? Sure. And maybe how it even affected, if you know how it affected your own family. Oh, of course. Uh, let me uh, go back a little bit. Sure. You know, the famine was in 1845 uh, is when it began. But there were famines before that. In fact, there were five famines before that particular famine. What made the famine of 1845 so serious was that the Irish couldn't eat the food that they were growing because the British were using that food to uh, export to uh, London. So all of the, the animals that were being slaughtered and all of the, the vegetables that were, were being grown were continuing to be grown but they were being sent to England. But the Irish, the lumper, that particular potato that they ate and that they relied on, they could do for a couple of seasons of that lumper rotting because they were, they were good enough. They knew how to, how to prepare and they knew they could eat things in the field. But that famine lasted the longest. That went from 1845, 1848, 1849. They couldn't recover. Every year the blight came back. And then in uh, now, you mentioned the blight might have come in from Mexico. Well, the blight originally corrected it. From research, it originated in Mexico. Now, how would it have come from Mexico to Ireland? Well, it went throughout the United States, and it also went throughout oh. Europe. So that wasn't only the Irish blight. Oh, okay. In fact, that same potato blight is currently now in the, the, uh, the forest up by San Francisco, in, where the redwoods are, and they have, they, have, they have that roped off, and they have... Uh, oak trees that now are suffering from the blight, the same that caused the potato famine. So that particular virus is still there. But you see, we don't rely, we have now ways to fight that virus for the plant. I thought that was really interesting when I was in that San Francisco area mm -hmm. to see that. But uh, you see, it went all through Europe, and, then it was, and it wasn't as devastating because there was food. Other people food had other besides food. potatoes. Correct. And if it attacked another turnip or, you know, the root vegetable, mm -hmm. they had other food. Mm -hmm. So it didn't devastate. The Irish were completely devastated. In fact, they called that the 19th, uh, the Holocaust of the 19th century because, you know, millions died. 2.5 million Irishmen either immigrated or died from the famine. You know, they died on the side of the road. And if they couldn't pay their rent, the British would just, uh, uh, you know, burn the cottage. Well, I, when I was in Ireland, my husband and I did, well, yes, he was with me when we saw a Famine Cemetery. Right. Actually, it was a children's uh, Famine Cemetery, and it was very touching. Uh, there really were hardly any markers, it was, uh, but it was uh, where the children were buried uh, oh, in this right. particular, uh, this was in uh, Sligo. Oh, of course. In Sligo. Those are very sacred places. Uh, many of those children um, weren't buried with their parents. Because, you know, if they weren't yet baptized, if they were baby, little baby infants, uh, many of those babies didn't make that because of the mothers, they were starving to death. And uh, they, they, some of the Irish, they were eating nettles and they were eating uh, dirt. They were eating, and, and you know, and you had asked how the famine affected my family. It turned family uh, uh, away from family because you couldn't trust anybody. They, were, they would be steal your food. Survival of the fittest. It was survival. And you see, they brought that mentality to America and that's why my family was so miserable, because my grandparents were raised by famine survivors. So it wasn't a very happy lot of people. Uh, they were destitute still, and that was in their mentality. Anything that they could get, even after the famine, they would certainly share. The Irish are wonderful people, but they became very suspicious, and, and they became very guarded. So my grandparents brought that to America, the suspicion and, and the guarded nature. And they raised their children with that. And then, of course, my parents were raised with that very same 
And then, of course, my parents raised us with the guarded and the suspicion. And that's why, you know, many of the people that I talked to at the festival and I give the talks, they say that's how their families were. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that. Yes. Now, you mentioned that uh, uh, when you were giving your talk to the cultic women, that your mother and father were divorced and yeah. that your father took two of your, your the male, the two boys, mm -hmm. and your mother took the two girl, you two girls. Now, um, but now, as I recall, you didn't see each other for 30 years. 30 years. That's and correct. then, was it after you wrote this book that you reunited? Uh, well, when my mom died in 1988, all four of us got together. And we hadn't really, we hadn't been together, the four of us, as family, in 30 years. You see, because that same mentality of you know, my parents, we, uh, there were lines drawn. Mm -hmm. And I was only 12, but there was a line drawn. And somehow I knew it made no sense. And now it makes no sense, but, but that's how I was raised. I saw that line, and you didn't cross that because you wouldn't want to hurt your mother, or you wouldn't want to, uh, to God forbid, I would call my father on the telephone. You see, then that would be, uh, that would be bad for my mother. So that's the, the kind of thing. And yes, writing the book, what was wonderful about that, so many Irish people say to me, thank you for writing this. This is my story as well, because they could see themselves in the story. And my family, my, my two brothers and sister, uh, they love it. And they have they only wish that I had written it earlier, because maybe they could have saved them some grief, could have maybe changed the kinds of way that they feel and that they think. Well, it made you more understanding of what they went through. Correct. Uh, I, I know my mother always tried to point out to me that I should try to understand where this person comes from. And there's even uh, an Indian, uh, Native American uh, saying that walk a mile in someone's uh, moccasins. It's true. Uh, so that you can understand where they're coming from. You know, we grew up not really loving our grandparents. We feared my mother's mother. My grandfather, his, her husband, was a wonderful man, but he died when I was five years old. I didn't know my father's mom and dad. I didn't know my dad had nine brothers and sisters. I mean, that's how very secretive this family was. So when I began to learn about the Murphys and the Shays from County Kerry, I learned to love them. That was more important to me than anything, because then I could identify with them, and I could choose favorites, mm -hmm. and I, could, I knew about their lives. And that was very, very satisfying to me. So you didn't get to know your mother and your father's family uh, until you were uh, well into your adulthood. Or actually, you were retired already. Correct? correct. I just met my two cousins for the very first time, and they're in their 70s, the very first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and they knew my father, their Uncle Mike. Mm -hmm. I didn't know they existed. So you see what you can find out. Now, maybe you'd like to show us this cane before you're oh, yes. uh, not. It's, this um, is a walking stick. Walking stick. And this belonged to my grandfather's brother. This is over 100 years old. And you can see all the, he used to, to poke at the turf fire, and it's all burnt on the bottom.